good to be in God's house today, amen? amen? I'm so glad you're here. And once again, we are back with our Chronological Christ series. It's, we go in pretty much the order of the events as they happened in the gospel messages through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are our gospels. We've been uh, taking a little uh, time spent mostly in John lately, it seems. John uh, is uh, unique out of all of the, th the four gospels. It's... Uh, uh, really focuses in on the Lordship of Jesus Christ, really, big time. It's, it is just a wonderful gospel. It sets itself apart from the other three in that way. But uh, we have found that Jesus in our storyline has been at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they had a, um, a ceremony of, of where they would take water from the Pool of Siloam and they went and uh, with the priest carrying the water in a golden container and they would go before the altar at the temple and they would make an offering to the father in heaven for his blessing on the crops that season that there would be plenty of rain and nourishment for a good crop good harvest in the fall and jesus says you know i am the living water in that context and it really hit them hard especially the religious crowd of the pharisees the sadducees and they were convicted, but they wanted Jesus out of the scene. And they sought to kill him from that day forward. They wanted him gone. He's claiming to be God. He's cutting into their religion business. And uh, they weren't going to be following the Lord anytime soon. They wanted him dead. And they were figuring ways out to eliminate him. And so that's where we kind of left things. Now today we're going to begin after our uh, opening prayer we're going to have like a little parentheses. He's still at the, at the Feast of Tabernacles, but the uh, writers of the scripture inserted a, a storyline here. And then we're going to get through that storyline in just a moment. And we're going to hook back in to the Feast of Tabernacles and pick up where we left off last week. So that's just the order of how things played out in the scriptures. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness. Bless the reading of your word to our understanding. Help us to apply these truths to our walk with you. And Lord, if we've yet to have a walk with you, may this be the day of salvation. You tell us that today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. You also tell us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Lord, we pray that that would happen today if there's a need for salvation in our midst. Lord, bless our online audience and all the technology bringing it out to the rest of the world that aren't here. But Lord, we just thank you for who you are. God of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Bless our hearts now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So let's do this little parenthetical storyline here. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Okay. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple, as was his tradition, and to teach, and all the people came to him. So he had great throngs of followers at this point. They want to see the next miracle. They want to see what he's going to say next, hear what he's going to say next, what he's going to do next. And he sat down, and that's how they taught back then. They didn't stand at a podium like this. They would all sit down. And the teacher would sit in front, and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees, those that had their degrees in the word in the Old Testament of, of the Lord, the law, they brought to him a woman caught in adultery. Can you imagine? It's like today, if the Lord was here teaching us today, sitting down in front of us, and we're on the floor, and all of a sudden we hear a ruckus out in the doorway, and we hear all this commotion, and they come and they bring this woman, pretty much just throw her in front of everybody. We caught this woman in adultery, Jesus. What do you think about this? What should be done to her? Look, look what they say. When they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. It makes you think, where were these guys at? What were they up to to find somebody in that very act of adultery? These, were, these guys were about no good. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. They're trying to trip him up and expose him as a fraud. They're going to this great extent of interrupting a teaching service and making a commotion and, and humiliating this woman in front of the whole town. If she wasn't an outcast already, she is now. 
Shameful. Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say, Jesus? What do you say? This they said, what? Testing him. You don't test the Lord. That they might have something of which to accuse him. They needed a good reason to kill him. They're going to kill him. They're just trying to justify the killing now because they really have no reason to kill him. He's done nothing wrong. Everything's been good. Everything that he's claimed to be God and everything he's done from God has all been to glorify the Father in heaven and to validate his claims of who he is. They want to kill him. But they were trying to trip him up to accuse him. Now, if Jesus rejected the law of Moses at this point, his credibility would be gone. If he held to the law of Moses, his reputation for compassion and forgiveness would have certainly been questioned. So humanly speaking, me and you were in this predicament, which of course we never would be as far as being God, but what would we do? How would we respond? Think about that one. I don't know how we could we respond, but look what how Jesus responds in the most unlikely fashion. Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Interesting. So when they continued asking him, because what are you going to do, Jesus? What are you going to do? She's supposed to be stoned. I bet they had pockets full of stones. They're ready to go. They continued asking him. He raised himself up and said to them, what, what could he say? It's brilliant. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Wow. Wow. Showstopper, mic drop moment. Amen? Amen. He who is without, without sin. So he, Jesus, as always, is going to appeal to his own law. So he goes to Deuteronomy 13, 9. You can write that down. I'm not going to go there. But that's where it says that the witnesses of a crime are to start the execution. But only those who were not guilty of committing the same sin could participate in that stoning, in that judgment. So Jesus is, he doesn't work above the law, under the law, around the law. He's not going to nullify the law. But he's going to use the law righteously, rightly dividing the word of truth. So he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And what's he do next? I think he very calmly and yet authoritatively sits himself back down. That would have, I don't know, might have a calming action to it amidst that crowd who's in turmoil right now, no doubt, on so many emotional levels. But what's he do now? Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Wow, what is he writing? So he seems to be using this writing on the ground as not only a calming effect possibly, but a delaying device to give them a minute to think. To, ration, to rationally think about what's going on before them. By the way, this is the only time Jesus is mentioned as writing. Isn't that interesting? It's very ironic because more has been written about him, pro or con, than any other person who's ever lived. So what did Jesus write? I want to know. We don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us, but we can get a good idea because like I always say, and like I've been taught, and like any good theologian would be uh, recommend doing, is to understand that scripture interprets itself. So you gotta do some mining for some gold. And when you search the scriptures, I found in Jeremiah 17, 13, I'll put that up on the screen. It says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you, and that's what the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the religious crowd are doing, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me, the Father says, shall be what? Written in the earth. Oh, oh, written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, 
The fountain of living waters. Just leave it right there for a minute. Yeah. The fountain of living waters. So back at the Feast of Tabernacles in our lesson last week, did he not proclaim he was, he had the living waters to dispense upon anyone who believed in him? Yeah. And he used the backdrop of that, that water celebration rite of worship uh, for God to bless the crops. And he says, that's me. I'm the living waters. That's a picture of me that enraged them enough to want to kill him. And I think this verse ties into what's going on here. When you forsake the Lord, you're forsaking the fountain of living waters. And that's exactly what they're doing. And it says, those who depart from me shall be what? Written in the earth. Well, that's got a multi-level uh, to it. But uh, I'm thinking uh, maybe Jesus is writing the names of the people that are in their midst like, Joe Schmo, I know you're having an affair with Mary Jane over here, and so he's writing their names down in the ground. And Jack, I know you're having something here with Betty, and she's not your wife, and he's writing that down. I don't know. A little speculation there. But I think he's writing somebody's names that are in the midst there, in the, in the ground, because they're rejecting him, and they're placing judgment on a sin that they've already committed in their life on someone. They want to take her life. So again, what did he write? Let's look at another scripture. Let's dig a little deeper in Psalm 98. Psalm 90, verse 8. says, you have set our iniquities before you. So if he's writing on the ground, maybe he's setting their sins before them. Because our sins do go up to the Lord. There's no secret sins that we commit that the Lord doesn't know about. Can I get a witness? Amen. And that's scary. That's frightening. We're not getting away with anything. We think we're doing things in secret in the dark. We're going places on the web and stuff yeah. we shouldn't be doing. Hey, you know what? God knows all about it. Exactly. Our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Maybe Jesus is writing down their names and their secret sins are now coming to light because Jesus is lighting them up before them. I don't know. But we use scripture to interpret scripture. So this is an educated guess. Amen? Yeah. And when we see what happens next, it's pretty likely that this is what happens. But I needed scripture to back it up, and there it is. So look at this next screen here. Secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. You may want to put that in the margin of your Bibles. Secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. There's nothing hidden from God's eye. And we're all going to stand before the Lord as believers. And the movie of our life is going to play. And everybody's going to see it. The holy angels are going to be there. And now this is after we've been saved. Now all that stuff before we were saved, thank God, is gone. It's not going to be remembered anymore. It's cast as far as the east is from the west. It's forgiven and forgotten by God, believe it or not. But everything we've done since knowing Jesus now is going to be on our movie yeah. for all to see. Just know that. Secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. And we can lose reward, but not our salvation. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. This is talking to believers here. But Jesus is dealing with mostly unbelievers here. So Jesus is illuminating their sin, I believe, by writing on the ground. So let's go back to our text in verse 9. Then those who heard it, being convicted, I bet they were, by their conscience, went out one by one. This big crowd, one by one, is leaving. Look at the order, beginning with the oldest. Those who know the best and know are the wisest, know the word the best, have lived the longest and seen it all. They're the first ones to get out of Dodge. They know better. Beginning with the oldest, even to the last, even to the youngest. And Jesus was left alone. I bet, I bet he never stopped writing. I bet he's just gone, gone. He's got his head down, he's writing. That woman's standing there all humiliated in this deafening silence. But you hear the footsteps departing, departing, departing. Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, it's just her and him. He's sitting, she's standing. When Jesus had raised himself up, there's no telling how long he's been sitting there. There's a big crowd. I'm sure he had a lot to write. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, 
Where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Now she knows she's guilty. She's ashamed. But there's no witness. You've got to have a witness according to the law to put somebody under the death penalty and her witnesses have gone. She said, no one, Lord. My witnesses are here. No one. No one has condemned me at this point. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. A literal interpretation would be, leave your life of sin. Yes. Quit doing this. Quit it. Stop. You've been forgiven. Now, the question may be asked, the skeptic would say, well, is Jesus reversing the Mosaic law? Is he, is he changing the law? Is he, you know, just ripping it up and doing something different here? No. You know what he's doing? He's thinking ahead to his sacrifice. He's placing his cross between the woman and her sin, just like he did for me and just like he does for you. Yes. Fascinating. Look at verse 12. Sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again. Now, we're done with that parenthetical story. We are now back at the Feast of Tabernacles. Here's where the storyline picks up where we left off last week. Then Jesus spoke to them again, the group that just heard him proclaim that he had the water of life and they wanted to kill him. And um, the feast is ongoing. He says another statement that's going to outrage them and enrage them. I am the light of the world. Amen. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. And now you've got to know the backdrop of this. Every night at the Feast of Tabernacles, they had a tradition at this feast. It's a lighting ceremony. There were four large lamps in the temple court of the women. That's what it was called, the temple court of women. And every night they would light these lamps and they would just light up the whole area like a little stadium area. And a great celebration would happen. There'd be dancing. The uh, Levitical orchestra would play praise songs and everybody would dance and sing to the Lord. Jesus took the opportunity of this lighting celebration, just like he did with the water rite celebration and offering to God the Father in the temple to portray another spiritual analogy for the people by saying, I am the light of the world. See all those lights going on? It's a picture of me pointing to me. This whole Feast of Tabernacles is pointing to me. They're hating that. At least the religious crowd is. There's some that are believing him. There's some that are getting excited and worshiping him. But most are skeptical at best. And those who had power and status in the, in the crowd religiously wanted to kill him. So we see a veiled reference here to the Jews, I believe, following the pillar of fire in the wilderness way back in Moses' day. That was Jesus too, by the way. The pillar, the cloud of fire that led them out of Egypt, the bondage of Egypt, sinful Egypt, into the freedom and bounty of the promised land. It was the pillar of fire the light of the world, Jesus Christ, was leading them out. The pre-incarnate Jesus back in the days of Moses. Can I get a witness? So that's in Exodus 13, 21. You want to check that out. But a little side note. There are eight I am statements in the book of John. And uh, I challenge you to memorize them. Find them. You're going to have to look them up. Don't Google them. But I guess you can if you get tired of digging. But... Uh, as long as you memorize them. So I'm not going to go through those today, but there's two already he's mentioned in our study. He says, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6. He's already been there. And I am the light of the world right here. So you got two. You only need uh, seven, six more. All right. Then the Pharisees therefore said to him in verse 13, oh, okay, they're going to try to trip him up again. You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Because the law says you have to have uh, two or three witnesses. 
if you're going to make a claim, to be validated. So the Jews are mockingly bringing up what Jesus had said to them in John 5.31. And if you remember, he says, I, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So Jesus is adhering to the law. He says, you know, I need a witness. However, Jesus' words there and here are reconciled by the fact that the Old Testament law required not one, but multiple witnesses to establish the truth of any matter. And that's uh, Deuteronomy 17.6. So I thought I'd put up here today I'm gonna, this uh, slide with uh, witnesses that we've seen so far regarding uh, Jesus' claim of being Messiah, the Son of God. Because first of all, he's God. He doesn't need a witness. He already has the witness of the Father in heaven. Remember at the baptism of Jesus where uh, the Father's voice in heaven uh, said, Hear him, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And, and the Spirit... The Holy Spirit came down, uh, it was kind of like a, a dove upon him, and he was spirit-filled in the flesh for his ministry work. So there was the, the two witnesses right there, the Father and the Spirit. But he's God, you know, that was just for our benefit. He always had the witness. But in the scripture, Jesus has so many witnesses. John the Baptist witnessed that he was the voice crying in the wilderness that was foretold. Here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's pointing Jesus out and declared him and heralded him into his earthly ministry. And then secondly, we see the Samaritan woman. Remember she uh, brought him water and he says, I'll give you the water of life. And she went and told everybody in town, all the men in town that she knew. And because she had questionable character, but you know what? She was a great witness. She got saved. So she witnessed and all these people got saved because of her witness. And then the works of Jesus were validating and witnessing that he is son of God, the healings and everything that was foretold Messiah would do. He was doing it. So the works and the father in heaven at the baptism, as we just said, uh, the Old Testament itself, every picture, the, 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 the lighting ceremony, the waters and so on and so on and so on. We're all pointing to Jesus. That's why it was written. And then the crowds that were following. We just saw a crowd in John, uh, well, there's a crowd in John 12, 17. We saw them throughout the other Gospels also. There's always a remnant of believers proclaiming he is who he claims to be. And, of course, the Holy Spirit himself bears witness of the Son. That's his job. One of his many jobs is to always glorify the Son. And the Son glorifies the Father. The Spirit never glorifies itself, himself, I should say. He's the third person of the Godhead. So anyway, I just wanted to show you guys some, uh, Jesus is well witnessed here uh, of being Messiah and the Son of God. So even though the opposition is great, he, he is uh, so within his law that the Jews cannot come against him concerning witnesses. But they're going to try because they're blind and because they're ignorant of their own law that they have degrees in. It's sad. It is so tragic. And so let's go back to our text. In verse 14, Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. I'm God, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from and where I'm going. You've rejected me. You've denied me. I've told you where I've, got, where I've come from and where I'm going, but you, you don't want to hear it. You want to kill me. Um, and so, wow, his witness is true. Their judgment is limited. It's superficial. It's just a lot of spiritual illiteracy going on with those who are supposed to be professionals about the law of God. So sad and tragic. Still happening today, though. Look at verse 15. Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh. Your own wisdom, your own ways. Nothing spiritual. There's no discernment. There's no Holy Spirit guidance. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. Jesus constantly was demonstrating his dependence on the Father in his earthly ministry. Constantly consulting him. Depending upon him. Bringing glory to the name of the Father. Uh, and yet they didn't want to have any of that. Jesus had an intimate union with the Father who guaranteed the truth of the Son's witness 
of all that he did. Jesus threw it back to the Father. They were one. There's the witness. There's the fulfillment of the law alone right there. He didn't need it, but he had it. It is also written in your law, Jesus is educating the educated now, that the testimony of two men is true. If somebody comes up and says something against somebody, there's two witnesses saying it's true, it's true. It's going to hold up in the court. Uh, that's Deuteronomy 17.6. You want to check that out. Verse 18, I am one who bears witness of myself. And the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So there, there's all you need to know. Yeah. The Father and Son are harmoniously together regarding the identity of Jesus. In Matthew 3.16 Again, we saw at the baptism, a, a, suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, the father, in whom I am well pleased. There's the witness right there. So he's really educating them in their own law. And it must be humiliating to them, just like they humiliated the woman caught in the act of adultery. Then they got smart alecky here and said to him, where is your father? I don't know, were they thinking of Joseph, his earthly father? That was in name only, right? Um, where is your father? Are they talking about the heavenly father? Maybe both? They're just saying this with such disrespect. Where is your father? Uh, see, they can't think nothing more than on human terms. They can't spiritually discern what Jesus is laying down for them because they're rejecting the spirit of God infiltrating their hearts. Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. That's why you can't discern all this. You don't know me. You're rejecting me. You don't know my father. You claim to know my father. You're teachers of his law. You don't know my father. Because you know all about the letter of the law. You know nothing of the spirit of the law. You can't apply the law and live the law at all. You don't know us. And so what a frightening thing to hear as one that claims to be educated in the word. They were claiming to be saved. They were claiming to know God. They were claiming to be part of the kingdom. They were claiming to be the chosen. Jesus says, you don't know me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. So my question to you in closing is, do you really know Jesus? He knows you. And he knows all of our secret sin. And that should have our knees shaking in fear. He knows us that intimately. We can't hide from Jesus. We can't find a place to hide our sin. He knows it. That's why he died for us. Because he knows us. He knows how bad we are. How much we've offended him and broken his law. He knows us so well. That's why he came and died. for. He didn't have to. But he died to pay my sin debt, your sin debt, because we all have a debt we cannot pay. Amen. But we all owe. Yes. And he gives us all an opportunity to choose eternal life and have our debt paid off through a relationship with him now, not later. No second chances this part, this, uh, uh, the other side of this life. Believers are called to be added to Jesus's witness list. That list we just went down of all the witnesses. I think I had seven of them listed. I should have put eight because we are in there too. Yeah. If you're born again, then you have a story to tell. He's done some transforming in your life. There's something for you to give glory to the Lord for Amen. to someone that doesn't know him. Amen. Well, it's Famously been said many times that uh, salvation or evangelism work is simply uh, telling another beggar where to find bread. You found the bread of life. Don't you, you know, if you found a, a million dollars, you'd be wanting to hand it out to your friends and family. You got more money you can know what to do with. And you found something more precious than that, the bread of life. Yes. Eternal life, forgiveness of sins, purpose, meaning, significance of life here and now and hereafter. You're a beggar who found bread. Why wouldn't you want to go tell somebody else about it? That's the natural thing that God supernaturally empowers us to want to do 
to be able to do. Amen. He puts a joy in your heart as he transforms you. The joy of your salvation is contagious. Believers are called to be added to that witness list of Jesus. So get on there and get witnessing, going and telling. Regarding Jesus as Messiah and regarding Jesus as the Son of God, accept no other imitation. There's plenty of those out there. So how could you not go and tell what the Lord has done for you if you indeed have been born again and saved? I mean, you, you guys that are saved know what I'm talking about. So my challenge, as always, is go out there and give them Jesus. Don't I say that usually at the end of the message? Yeah. Well, it's not just a saying, go and tell. We are commanded to go and tell as his people. So and we're going to finish with verse 20. I think we got one more verse. These words, Jesus spoke in the treasury of the temple as he taught in the temple and no one laid hands on him. They were so devastatingly convicted. No one laid hands on him. And that was all part of God's supernatural plan for Jesus on earth to get him to the cross safely and right on time as the Father has intended to sacrifice his life for ours. For his hour had not yet come. Jesus is coming soon. That hour is upon us. And my question is, are you sure that you're sure that you're sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that if he came today, before I spoke my next word, and boom, we're gone, and it's going to be that quick. Or if you have a heart attack, it's going to be that quick. Or if you get hit by a car or drive by shooting, it's going to be that quick. I don't know when you're going to go, but God does. Yes. And it's going to be that quick. You're not going to have any say anymore. Jesus is coming soon. His hour of return is, is near. So please stand. We're going to close in prayer. And if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, or maybe you want to have a, an assurance of your salvation, I've got just the guys up here to meet with you to give you assurance from the Word of God. Or if you have questions, they're here, I'm here. Or you want to be baptized, you want to take that next step. That's a command also. Once you're saved, that's the first act of obedience you can make as a new believer is to be baptized. We're having that on Easter, so let us know if you need that. We'll have a class for you. But uh, whatever your need is, don't leave here without it being fulfilled because God's word will be revealed to you. If you it's for the asking. That's what we're here for. Not just to have some flowery words and send you on your way until next week. God wants to transform your life. He wants to use us to do it. But you've got to submit to his calling in your life for him to work that transformation process. Amen. Amen. Father, we come to you thanking you for your goodness. If there's someone here today that has a question that wants salvation from Jesus by faith alone in him, may they come forward. May they even step out now with a boldness to, to come up here and talk with our guys. And Lord, if there's a lady that wants to speak to a lady, she'll be up here. So, Lord, uh, let, their, let their faith be placing feet to their faith at this point to come forward. And, Lord, we pray that uh, if there's questions, if there's doubts, if there's concerns, if there's uh, baptisms, if there, whatever the need may be, may they not leave here today without it being fulfilled. So, Lord, we love you because you first loved us. We thank you for being the light of the world. And, Lord, we just see so much darkness around us. Help us to shine. We have the light of life in us through your Holy Spirit. Enable us, Lord. Burden us to be hungry for your word, to be hungry to grow closer to you, to be hungry to live a life that's pleasing to you, Lord. Give, give us that hunger, that spiritual hunger, because you've laid out a feast for us through your scriptures. And Lord, it'll last that Hunger pains will go away and there'll be fulfillment, satisfaction here and now and hereafter if we just sit down at the table with Jesus. So Lord, we love you, Ken, because you first loved us. Help us to go and tell now. In Jesus' name we ask these things and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next week.